just finished recording a great episode with Dwayne Brown. Dwayne came full of knowledge and most importantly, enthusiasm for his real estate journey. He went from zero units, 22, about to be 28 units really quickly. And it's an impressive feat, which he's accomplished. And he's just part of the way through his journey. Uh, I think uh, was one of the best tidbits he gave, don't get lost in the sauce. There's a lot of big things that you can use to overcomplicate the real estate process. But when it comes down to it, it's a very simple mathematical concept. Don't make it too complicated. Patrick, what did you think about today's episode? Fantastic. To be able to build that portfolio and be cash flowing over 10K a month in less than three years, he drops nuggets throughout the entire thing. Make sure you listen to the end. He gives you all of the different resources that have helped him along the way. So we know you're going to enjoy it. And here it is. How's it going, everybody? And welcome back to The Real FI Podcast. I'm your host, Patrick McGrath, with my co-host, James Ripion. How's it going today, James? It's going well today, Patrick. I'm excited, as always, for our next guest. We've got Dwayne Brown here. He's going to be sharing his passion about real estate and financial independence. So we're excited to get into it. So without further ado... Wayne, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about what you do and what you got going on. Hello, guys. Hello, all. Um, I'm Dwayne Brown. Um, I'm investing here in New Jersey. Um, I'm a father. I have five kids. Um, I'm married. I work day to day as a electrical engineer, field engineer, test engineer for the local power company here in New Jersey. Um, I enjoy going to the gym and I enjoy, uh, buying properties. I enjoy to increase my, um, my portfolio. Um, and th th that's pretty much me. That's pretty much me. So any other questions, please feel free to ask, but I'm very passionate and, um, um, very, uh, involved with real estate. It's, it's definitely my baby. baby right so now. Tell us a little bit about where your real estate journey began. Like when did you first get into it? What made you get into it? Give us a little bit about that background. Okay, so I started uh, in 20, uh, 2019. 2019, I closed on my first asset. That was a multifamily in my um, in my area. I live in the suburb of the, uh, Trenton, New Jersey, so Ewing, New Jersey. So that's where I bought my first. And honestly, I work as a field engineer, and I work a ton of overtime. So. I was working um, and I had to go away for like a few weeks and I was work making a ton of a ton of overtime, like, you know, seven, eight, all, upwards of $10,000 a week because I was just working a lot. Right. And once I got my paycheck, I, you know, with Uncle Sam, of course, who's a silent partner in, in, in that. Right. I re re realized the returns were, well, my check was just, you know, I was barely getting half of those huge numbers I was gro I was grossing. So. From that, I began to look at like bigger pockets. I began to read audio, um, listen to audiobooks, read books, uh, podcasts, webinars, and that just kind of uh, lit fire. Oh, and I went to a real estate meetup. One of my buddies um, I've known for years introduced me to a real estate meetup. We went there, and I networked with so many people. And um, those people had like, um, I say, uh, uh, big pockets and small egos, right? Because they were they were all about sharing their experiences and sharing their their path. And that really um, ignited me and made me realize that, hey, real estate is the key. Working every day for a great six-figure job, you're still not going to have the success or financial freedom that you would have unless you invest. So that kind of um, is what got me to the point where I am today. That's amazing. I, I, I absolutely love that. We have harped on meetups a million times on this podcast. James and I met at a meetup. Uh, we run our own meetups. We go to meetups all the time. It's absolutely great. And I love that you made sure to bring that up. Now let's, let's jump into that first deal. Like, how did you find it? You know, you said it's a multifamily. Is it duplex, triplex, quadplex? Like why, like, what was it about this deal that like, you were like, this is the one. Okay, so yeah, it's a multifamily, a, a duplex. Um, the purchase price was uh, one hundred and twenty-five thousand, I believe, one twenty-eight or something like that. I got some seller's concessions credit, so one twenty-five for simple numbers, and it rented for shy of two thousand. So, looking at that deal, you know, initially, I started to <clears throat> excuse me, I started to look and I started to use you know tools like the one percent rule, two percent rule, you know, and I started to see, hey, based on this purchase price, what's the cash flow going to look like? 
So once I began to get familiar with running deals, I realized, like, hey, in my market right now, especially at that point, interest uh, money was dirt cheap, right? Interest, I believe I have a four four percent um, um, interest rate on that property. So cash flow, I'm like, the mortgage is going to PITI is going to be like nine hundred bucks, and the rents for almost two thousand. I said. Um, I don't think no one is giving you almost a thousand dollars. No bank, no crypto, no no currency, in my opinion, right now is going to give you that type of returns monthly, provided the tenants pay rent, right? So that is what um was a driver behind um um purchasing that that asset. And I almost four years now, and the same tenants been in there. You know, I renovated the property, the exterior, and um. It's it's been a great property to to add to my portfolio to to get me started for sure. Do you have any idea what that property is worth today? I mean, you bought that thing in yeah, 2019, yeah. so it's yeah, been a crazy yeah, ride since then. So, what kind of equity are we sitting on? Exactly, that's a great, great, great question, James. So, I purchased it for 125, and um, I got in a reappraise last year for like 300k. <laughs> So, of course, leverage, right? I use a cash out refinance and I pulled some cash out of that. And that helped me buy a few other deals that I, I did uh, uh, earlier 2022 or something like that. It's it's a blur at times, but yeah, it's worth about shy of 300K, uh, at least 300K in 2021 or 2022 when I did the refinance. That's amazing. And yep. I just have to harp again on how many times we've talked about this, but that first deal, it's the hardest one, you know, to get over the analysis paralysis mm -hmm. and actually lay it down for the foundation. But man, you hit it out the park. Thousand dollars a month cash flow. You've got 175k of equity in there. You probably pulled out, you know, 75 to 80 thousand plus exactly. your initial 78k exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. there, there we mm -hmm. go. Mm -hmm. Plus your initial down payment and renovation mm -hmm. costs, like yeah. You're, you're golden and that helped you buy more property. So yes. let's continue along this journey. So how long was it from buying that first one till you got that next one? Two weeks. Two weeks. <laughs> so yeah, I closed on my first November like 9th and I closed on the second like November 18th, November 20th. That was a single family. I got that one for 95,000. Um, I put 20% down. Uh, the mortgage is like 700 bucks and the rent for 1500 bucks. So that was like a, a simple metric. I was like, okay, if my rent could be double the amount of the PITI, I think I'm going to cash flow, right? Like I think, you know, especially with single family houses, all the expenses, the um, the snow, the um, the grass, you know, the heat, all the water, all those expenses fall on the tenant. So if the tenant is going to pay, you're going to make some money, right? I mean, that was just a simple simple way. So I just, once I said that, I said, wow, that's three units in like a few weeks. Okay. Let's keep going. I, like that's, that. I mean, that's, you're showing how not complicated this process is. I it's mean, not, it's really it's a basic not. analysis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know a lot of engineers, sometimes they've got the analysis paralysis issue because, you know, they want to figure everything out mathematically and make it make sense. Mm -hmm. But you know, a lot of times it can be distilled uh, to a point where you can kind of just look at the deal, income, exactly. estimate what your expenses are, and really generalize whether it's going to cash. Sure. So you really broke it down to its simple elements there. Exactly. And I think some people get so caught up in analysis paralysis. And I say, listen, man, come on, invest, invest, forget the rest. Real estate is so forgiving, right? You have so many different exit strategies. You have so many different options, but, but many of us, many of us people, we're just like, oh, I'm not sure. I want to get started. Or oh, you're doing real estate. That's cool. And I'm like, so what's stopping you, right? If, if you're in a position to have access to capital or you can save save some money, you can house hack, you can home make a line of credit, you can leverage your 401k. There's so many ways we can get access to capital so you can get started. And once you get started, you're going to go like, wow, I wish I started just a long time ago. And once you get started and you start to build some momentum, it's it's life changing. It's game changing. You're not going to want to, you're not going to want some of the things that we used to like the Louis, like uh, the, the designer, the real big expensive car. Some things you're going to say, you know what? I can invest that money and see much better returns opposed to buying depreciation, uh, depreciating assets. Mm. Now, we, we've interviewed a lot of people who have been in the game for a long time. A lot mm. of them starting around 2008, before 2008, 
not one of them has has said, I wish I would have started later. You know, exactly. even though they went through a challenging market, they started, they learned their lessons, they took their lumps, uh, and it really set them up for a lifetime of success in real estate. And now they've been in it, you know, for that period of time and have that much knowledge to to build from uh, and build their uh, their portfolio. So, you know, now we're up to three units. Are are those three units in the same uh, neighborhood or in the, in the same city? Um, and where'd you go from there? Um, yeah, they're very close. One's in the a town or the city area, Trenton, which is the capital of New Jersey, and the other is in a township, a suburb, suburban, um, suburb, very close. So after that, um, there was three, I got my fourth in about six months. I think it was January of 2020. So yeah, about no, not six, whatever that is, from November to three months, January. yeah, three months. I bought my, I bought my. Next one, which gave me four units. And that one was on the same street as the duplex. So I said, oh, that was cool, right? Because as investors, if you can have a little control over the neighborhood, right, you can help with, you know, the values, you can help with rents and all of that. So once I seen that property come up, and that property was turnkey, a flipper went in there, he renovated it, and he did a very good job. And um, I got it for like 80, 82,000, 82,000. And that property runs for 1,500. So the, and the PITI on that property before um, the taxes were raised, unfortunately, was like 600 bucks. So that was like my, that was 600 and my PIT, um, 600 PITI and it was run for 1,500. So I'm like, oh, that's another good one to add, right? So within a few months, I got four doors and I'm like, wow, that, that wasn't that hard. <laughs> And that just said, okay, let's let's just keep going, you know. And it's, I say, I tell so many people, man, don't 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 wait, just start, just start. And I love your your hat, Pat. Take action. And I say, I mean, I love your hat, and I've been saying that to so many people. Take action, just do it. Like it's it's going to be worth it, in my opinion. If you if you um put in the work, you're definitely going to see the great results. Thousand percent. All right. So we're at we're at four units in, mm -hmm. you know, four months basically. Yes. You know, you're you're cash flowing like two grand off of these mm -hmm. four almost. So wh where's your portfolio sitting at now? You know, you've you've been doing this for roughly roughly three years, you yes. know. So you the first four months you went out there and crushed it. Where are you sitting at now as of today? Right now, as of today, I have 22 units. 22 units and I Today, I just agreed um, on a six unit in the same area, in the same market. So 22, soon to be 28 units. Yes. That is absolutely mm -hmm. amazing with, within such a short period of time. So, you know, for everyone out there that's listening, it's like, where are you finding these? Are you finding these on the MLS? Or are these, are these, do you have some secret wholesaler, you know, <laughs> secret list or anything? You know, what, what's no. going on? Where are you finding these? Most I find on the MLS, right? Um, also, I do have wholesalers. I do have agents, you know, that I have um, re built relationships with who do send me some deals that are off market. But majority of my properties, I got all off the MLS, right? And I tell people all the time, despite what the property is listed for, um, I don't care. I'm going to I'm gonna offer what makes sense, you know. Um, my next house or a couple more units I got was another duplex. And it was listed for like 180K. Um, that same week, the seller dropped it to 160. So he wasn't getting much bites. I went and offered 110, and people were like, "Dude, you can't do that." I'm like, oh, "Yeah, I can. Let me watch me. Right? <laughs> I'm not a jerk at all, right?" But I said that 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 is what makes sense based on the rents. Um, I uh, inherited tenants with that, so I said that that's what that ugh, that is what makes sense, and um provided the house needed X amount of renovations and rehab. And I said that, that number cash flows. And I settled at 120. We said at 120, he gave me a clear CO and um, tenants lease was up in a few months. Once I closed, I raised rents by 50 bucks a unit, um, has a garage, you know, so that rents out as well. So I just said, you know, the MLS is not, I don't, I think it's, it's a great resource. However, it's a numbers game at the end of the day. You have to offer what makes sense, despite where you're getting it from, you know, um, wholesale, um, off market, door knocking, however you obtain a deal, the numbers have to make sense. That has to be the um, the driving factor for sure. Well, I think you're, you're highlighting a little bit of a hack that's good for this market is finding 
tenant occupied properties that are on MLS, because a lot of times, you know, retail buyers are going on there. They're looking for a place to live in, to move into. Mm -hmm. They're going to see tenant occupied and it's immediately disqualified. And then, yeah, you know, 100%. a lot of times investors are going to overlook that. So then you're, 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 you're matching the situation up where the sellers are frustrated because they're not selling it quickly. They want to sell, mm -hmm. obviously they're trying to sell. Um, so that's a great opportunity for buyers to come in, you know, take a look at what those existing rents are, realize that it's been on the market for a little bit, negotiate it uh, favorable, favorably. I've done plenty mm -hmm. of those deals for my clients, yep. um, you know, with those kind of circumstances. And, you know, it, it, it's funny that you know, who, who's telling you that you can't do that? Like you can't make an offer. Like, was it was it your agent? Was it, you know, people, um, people you were talking common, to? Yeah, a combination of agents or or especially buddies, uh, friends who are in real estate. Um, just, uh, just you know, shooting a breeze with people, you know, or even if I'm at a meetup and and I uh, articulate that that's sewer, they say, you did that? You, you sure? Wasn't that risky? I said, well, no, what are they going to do? You know, you know, punch me through the phone or through the text or whatever the case is. I said, that's 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 how I do it. You know, I mean, I, and I think that's how many investors do it. I'm not a genius. Right. I just think those are the tools that we use, you know, because it's a numbers game at the end of the day. We're not doing this because we're we want to be friends with the seller. You know, we, we we're doing this to 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 make an investment. And, you know, your capital has to be, you know, uh, sacred to you. So if you're going to invest it, you have to. um definitely have that in mind for sure and i i agree with with that so wholeheartedly and also remember you're dealing with a seller that bought an investment property they yeah. own an investment property they have tenants they most likely have at least one other property because majority of landlords own at you know a minimum of two properties most people mm -hmm. do so they have went through the process this before they have some knowledge of analyzing deals so when you go back to them and, and you break all the numbers down like they they can understand that's someone that should be more willing to at least understand where you, where you're coming from and be willing to play ball and you know it, it worked for you in this situation mm -hmm. and it's I, it sounds like it's probably worked for you in a lot of other situations so yes yes i agree <laughs> So let, let's go on to the next one. I love burning through these deals real quick because mm -hmm. th I think this stuff is so helpful. Okay. Okay. The next one. Let me see. The next one, I think, was just a regular single family that I found on MLS for uh, the next one was uh, like 70K, 72K. The seller was at like 80, 84, 83. I offered 67, you know, <laughs> and we went back and forth for a while. And I think we started like 71 or 72K. That property rents for um, uh, thirteen hundred, I think twelve hundred. I, I forgot twelve hundred bucks. Piti. I paid cash for that property. Um, I utilized my four hundred one k with some other cash flow I got from the other units. I did some savings. I paid seventy k cash for that property. Um, and within three to six, three months. Uh, no, I think it was six months because of seasoning. I. Did a cash out refinance, so I grabbed back my, you know, 52K or something like that. So I had 18K stuck in the house. But since then, I've recouped all of the, that capital. And um, that added and brought me to um, eight units, eight doors, I believe. Eight, I forgot. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that was that. Was, and then the next few were... Mm, uh, more single families, more single families. Uh, I, for, I so how forgot. Many, so let, let's break <laughs> yeah. down your portfolio and how many single yes. families and then how many multifamilies you got? Um, uh, Majority are single families. Um, with, Let me see. Uh, I think I have four multifamilies, four duplexes, and the rest are all single families. All right. Four duplexes and all, and the rest are yeah. all single families. Yes. And, and, and and in going through that process now, because, you know, a lot of people talk about it's it's easier to get into the single family game and kind of being at the duplex game, you know, is still kind of in that small multifamily. Like, definitely. Um, do you at, between the single family and the duplex, which one do you prefer as a do you see as a better investment? Um, I think cash flow wise, single family. Um. Ten, uh, duplexes rent for a little more, but you have your expenses. You're going to have the water most, in most duplexes. The water is not submeter, so you got to pay for the water, landscaping, um, snow removal. Um, 
but I some single family homes I have they cash flow very well, right? And I don't, I don't do it. I don't pay anything. So uh, they're very similar, but in my opinion, um, I think single family can cash flow better. And in my per per portfolio, particularly single family, has cash flow better. That's Patrick. I'm I'm kind of curious, like how your properties are set up. Are they separately water metered? Because this isn't something that I had an appreciation for when I bought my first multifamily. I've got one water meter at my property, so landlord's paying it. There's no bill back that mm -hmm. we're doing because it's not separately metered. Um, Patrick, I'm kind of curious. How how are your properties set up with that? So I have a few multi smaller multifamilies that are in rural areas that are on well water. So mm -hmm. they're nice. not they're not metered, but the water comes from the ground. So gotcha. um, no water bill there for my 10 unit apartment building. Um, there's only a water meter for each one for each building. And then what I did is I separately metered. I bought some meters from flows.com and um, I was able to sub meter out the, the water. Now I have not turned them on yet. Um, they're there because I, I put them in while I had tenants in place and I wasn't going to try to renegotiate for them to now pay water. So as the tenants turn, I'm starting to then, you know, go back and charge them for the water. But I have the building set up. So if I ever wanted to sell, I could have that already there to increase my my NOI. Um, but yeah, sometimes you are paying for you are paying for water. You know, I can tell you right now, I'm spending probably 250 bucks a week just on grass cutting between the couple properties that I have. Yeah. So thousand dollars a month right now, uh, you know, just in grass. So it does get expensive. Uh you know, for the, for those aspects. Now I really, I want to get into, you said you've done a couple cash out refis. So, you know, walk, walk uh, the listeners through a little bit of how you kind of went about those. And if you ran into any struggles. Okay. So I think once I got to like eight units or 10, I forgot, um, I started using, um, commercial financing. So all properties began to, um, close them LLC. And I started using hard money. So um, hard money, of course, you're going to um, put X amount of money down, 10%, 15%. And it's short-term financing. It's 12 to 18 months financing. So during that time, you have to, of course, renovate the property. And once the property is um, renovated and hopes you've increased the value of the property, and then your exit has to be um, um, a sale or a refinance to make the hard money lender whole. So um, I'm sorry, but what was your exact question again? I'm sorry, I'm rambling. About the, um, the cash out refinances. So when you were oh, going yeah, to yeah. when you're going to refinance these, you know, what was the process like, and did you run into any troubles? Um, no, not really. I I say probably some of my biggest headaches probably just were the appraisers, right? And um, I really think, and I'm I I I think I shared a sentiment with a lot of uh, investors. Appraisers are very conservative with appraisal reports when it comes to investors. But for, you know, um, owner occupier, a family is getting a home and there's already a contract in place for that purchase price. A lot of times that appraisal appraisal report will come with the valuation that's indicated on the sale, right? But for us as investors, when we're increasing the value and they don't have a guy, they, they, they just go by what they feel is appropriate to put a valuation on an asset. So um, if you increase the a value of a property and you're anticipating to see 200K and you get an appraisal report for 175 or 160 or something like that, that's extremely frustrating and tough because your deal um, analysis um, predicated upon that 200k or plus right and just to break it down if you get a, uh, if you have an asset and you're looking for an appraisal um uh, i'm sorry arv of uh 200k and you're looking to pull out say 70 percent or 75 depending how leveraged you want to be your cash every five is looking at 140 thousand. so hopefully that hopefully you're under 140 with respect to your purchase price renovations um interest only payments during the time of the project and of course, closing costs. That's another cost many of many many persons forget. Um, 
because using this process, it, we I call it, well, me and my buddies call it a double double exit, right? Because there's two closings, right? You're going to have your initial closing um, for your acquisition, and to exit, you're going to have another close. So that's 10K right there before before anything. It's 5K both ways, you know, in, in my market anyway, you know? Hmm, but no, exactly. to answer your question, no, I haven't had... No, no, I haven't had uh, any great deal of um, issues with the cash I refinance. Um, so I've, it's, I've, an awesome, should, it's an awesome. Go ahead. I was gonna say I share that pain with you, man. Like I've I've been working with appraisers that have just come back with unfavorable numbers. Yeah. But you know what? What have you done to kind of remediate that? Like you know, and if appraisal is coming back, or uh, is there a way that you've kind of streamlined that process to help guide an appraiser to kind of get to the number you're yes. Trying? Yes. Funny enough, um, I Pat helped me with a something called an information packet. So um, uh, I had an appraisal, appraisal, and I literally had three appraisals for one property, and it was just a headache. Eventually, I we got a, a K valuation that we moved forward with, but that was a little tough because the lender needed the a properties to appraise for a certain valuation before you can do. They had they have loan minimums, right? So. If the property's appraised for like, I don't know, 80K, I'm sorry, 70K, that wasn't good because they want the properties appraised for 75K or 100K, whatever the, the minimum is. So I saw Pat um, post uh, uh, make a post about the information packet. And the information packet had the lease agreements, it had um, the budgets, it had um, pretty much just a welcome letter warming the appraiser up or hit him or her, of course, to let them know that, hey, this is everything we did to the property. These are before pictures. You're going to take after pictures, including your report. So you're going to see, you know, the value that we added. And um, that has helped me a lot. That has helped me tremendously. Um, the appraiser comes in and I have a packet for them ready. And they're like, wow, Dwayne, this is good. This is nice. And wow, this is how much money you put. This is how the property looked um, before. So that has helped me tremendously, man. And it's just the power of, of networking and the power of social media for me to see what Pat did. And, and that is like my main staple. Now I'm in, I make sure, you know, that appraisal report is on property um, for the appraisal on that day of the uh, appraisal inspection. That's amazing. That's amazing. I love that. And for anyone out there that's looking for um, a copy of the appraisal packet, James and I have put one together. You can click the link in our description on our uh, link tree and we have it there. We've got one for commercial, one for residential. You just fill it out. It's all there. I've used it on every one of my properties and uh, it has helped. I've Honestly, since I started using it, I never once got an appraisal below what I was looking for. Exactly. Exactly. And Never. comps. I should say that comps. Of course, comps have to be in that packet as well. You know, with respect to purchase, sold price, um, square footage, comps, you know, bedroom count and bathroom count. So it's I believe it, I believe it helps. Um, just to give them that gu guidance, right? And sometimes you can get an appraiser and they'll come in it's like, wow, this is nice. Um, you know, they'll say, what do you think this is? You know, you know, they, they have integrity and standards, of course, but they'll say, Hey, what do you think? And when I hear that, I'm like, <laughs> okay, you know, that that's awesome. But um appraisals, they can be great, but they can be like a pain in the ass too <laughs> when it comes to a lot of this. And a lot, a lot, every a lot of stuff we do, especially using the Burr method, it predicates upon that, you know, that appraisal, that valuation. That valuation has to make sense, you know. If not, months of rehab and months of renovations and headaches can can really um set you backwards and and i say that to um to be kind because in my opinion real estate is so forgiving right so if you get a valuation of 20k less that's okay right because you just have 20k you have x amount of you're only going to get a percentage of the 20k that was that was that was that was um that you were um not giving you're out five valuation. grand exactly five grand. so yeah and at the end of the day every property you hold on to long if you hold on to it long enough is going to be a hundred percent return on investment. You just got to hold on to the property, right? Initially, if you get, you know, a, a unfortunate valuation, you're, you're a little bummed, but long-term as this buy and hold is a long-term vehicle, in my opinion, you're going to hopefully see success. I agree. Exactly. I didn't wait, man. That's a, it's an easy way to do yeah. real estate. <clears throat> Hard to yes. mess that up for sure. Um, exactly. I agree. So, you know, Dwayne, you got started in 2019. 
Uh, you yes. got into it in a sweetheart market, man. Like, you know, you got this bull run, you know, things might have gotten a little bit more challenging or maybe they're just a little different. You know, how have you pivoted in this market and how are you finding deals and like, how are you running your business differently today? Oh, it's it's pretty tough now, um, but it's not nothing's impossible. I believe in 2022, I got like three units, three doors. Right. It's just been tough. You know, and this year, uh, I don't know, I think I got two. Yeah, two, two. So, yeah, um, I have one rehab. I got one that was turnkey. I had another that's a rehab or about 70. I'm about 75 percent that done re rehab. And I just agreed on the six unit arm earlier this morning. But with interest rates have been tough to definitely cash flow. Um, competition now because the inventory is so low. So there's an there's there's a an extreme amount of challenges in investing in real estate, but nothing's impossible, right? Like you can just you factor in what the interest rate is um, to see if your property is going to cash flow. If you think you're going to get a seven, run your deal at a seven and a half or eight percent, right? And if you cash flow at that number, you will cash flow at the seven, right? Um, uh make offers go look at properties um start looking out of state there's so many vehicles and so many um different opportunities in real estate and um but however nothing's easy and nothing is truly passive like we say oh i want 10 15 20k passive like real estate isn't as passive as many things as many say right it's 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 a great business a great um um environment to be in but it's work. It's work like anything else. However, it's extremely rewarding, extremely rewarding and extremely forgiving. Well, along the lines of it being passive or not, you know, how are you managing these properties? Do you have a third party manager? Are you managing them yourself? Because you're up to you're about to be up to 28 units and you're getting close to that threshold where it's like, you know, maybe you should be starting a management company or, mm -hmm. you know, if it, if you're not managing already and you have it with a third party, it's not much of consideration. But, you know, how, how are you managing that part of your business? Yeah, I am self-managing. It's it's OK. Um, I it's weirdly enough. I enjoy it. Um, I have a Google I have a Google voice number. So I do have that separation between my personal life and my tenants. Residents, I like to call them right. Respect respectfully. Um, but um. Yeah, I'm reaching a point now where uh, it it can become a little headache. My wife sometimes says, "Which house is that? Well, who's that?" I'm just and I'm just like, "Uh, oh, I have a good memory and I'm pretty good at numbers, so I I kind of um always can think straight." But yeah, um, I've consider I've been considering looking at um I am considering I am looking for property management. Um, I've actually even considered um starting my own property management um company. Um, but yeah, I know eventually I'm definitely going to have to pass the baton to a, a, another um, person, to person or persons to 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 um to continue this. But as of now, I'm 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 moving okay, and I I'm enjoying it. People say I'm crazy, but I I, I enjoy it. Um, I don't do any like my repairs or anything. I have handyman, or you know, I just you know, I'm kind of like the middleman, right? If something's wrong. My tenants will text me most of the time. I prefer texts. And I'll just dispatch a handyman out. And you can hopefully develop relationships with some of these handymen where now they begin to get um, have good relationships with your tenants. They're on a first name basis and they can go fix this, fix that. And then I can just, you know, um, uh, what is it, Cash App or Zelle, Zelle the money or whatever the case is. So let's exactly. give our listeners some perspective. How, like you've got 22 units. How many hours a week? Are you spending on management? <laughs> um, not many. <laughs> I'd say like, I, I, not many. I'd say two, if, if that, right? It's not as, people say I'm crazy, but um, it's, it's, I don't, I don't think it's as much work as many say it is. I'm not saying it's easy. Please don't say that. However, it's, it's that's a process I put in place to kind of um, ensure that I wasn't getting involved too, too much. And I mean, I'm not a plumber. I mean, I'm really bad at carpentry work. Right. So I can't do I'm just I'm just not able to do some of these things or some of these issues. So, but yeah, I'm literally a middleman. The, you know, when things happen, you know, Mr. Brown, Dwayne, I'm going to be late. OK, no problem. Give me just communicate with me when you're going to pay. Um, of course, after the fifth late fee will be assessed. Um, 
I definitely try to, um, I'm extremely compassionate because I know times now recession and, and gas prices and food, I mean, eggs are $7 a dozen, right? So I'm extremely compassionate with people and their circumstances. And I, in my opinion, that's why a lot of um, t tenants like private landlords because they get a little, they get away with a little more leniency than they would if they were renting from, um, they're renting at another, um, another entity or bigger complex or something like that. So, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where I am with that. But yeah, I say, I, I say two hours max a week and that's, that's, that's very giving. <laughs> I think so too, with, with our 30, you know, 30 units, I'd say, um, it's, it's more of a mental thing, honestly, yes, than an actual 100%. physical thing. Like, you know, you, you get a text, there's an issue. Now it's, it's some, something you're doing something else. Now, all of a sudden you, you have to assess the situation. Is this an immediate need? Is this something I can push mm -hmm. till later? Is this something I can push till tomorrow or do, you know, so all of a sudden you have to gauge it. And then yes. it's like, let me, let me focus and think about it real quick. All right. And then I'm going to call the right, I'm going to call the person That's to go it. handle that. But it's, it's mainly a mental Mm -hmm. uh, managing this is more mental than actually physically doing a lot of stuff. When you start to build that network of handyman and all of your all of your different people, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, one, one, let me piggy on that, Pat. Many, many persons, many people get a, a nervous when they say, "Oh, what if I can't find a handyman?" Okay, this isn't ideal, but you can just call a company, right? If someone's toilet's backed up and you can't find a handyman to snake it, you can call. I don't know, Rotor Rooter, one of those outfits, right? They're going to charge you much more, right? They're going to charge you, you know, 500 to 800. It can charge you $1,000 to freaking unclog the toilet. But certain issues have to be addressed quicker than later, right? And if you can't get um, one of your handymen because he's working for somewhere else or he may have a full time job and this is what he does on the side. There's avenues for you to remedy the situation provided it's emergency and it does need attention quick. Quick, right but people get so lost in the sauce and they're like oh man i don't know what to do i don't have this person i don't have the right systems in place there's there's ways around issues and and that's another thing issues are going to happen roofs are going to reach um life expectancy furnaces are going to break uh doors are going to come up hinges water is going to leak right you're going to have all of those array of issues right that are some on the tenant's negligence and some are just wear and tear and just like when things reach life expectancy so you have to expect that right you have to expect that and definitely have uh broad 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 enough shoulders to expect and understand that this is a part of the game things are going to break things are going to uh get uh damaged and you just have to accept that and can and i always say always keep the main thing the main thing what's the main thing the main thing is um, these tenants, these residents, they they have an agreement with you and they have to pay rent and you have mortgages that you have to um, pay. So as long as, you know, they're living, you can keep the property in the correct um, um, condition and they're paying and you can pay your bills. That's it. Right. The arguments. I don't go back and forth for any of my tenants. If they want to give me a little aggression with text, I just say, OK, have a nice day. Right. I, I don't have time for that. Right. They can win every argument they want. Right. But respectfully, as long as they 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 are respectful enough and they pay their bills and I can pay my mortgages. then at the end of the day, respectfully, not to sound like a jerk, but Mr. Brown's winning. Right. I'm winning. I'm winning the 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 big the big the big game at, at the end of the day. You know, exactly. Exactly. Now, uh, we've got, you know, you're you're up to you're up to 22, almost 28 doors, mm -hmm. you know. I really want to break down um, a couple things here. One is with those 22 doors, you know, what, what's your monthly cash flow looking like? And then two, what's your goal? You know, where, mm -hmm. where are you trying to get? Is it 30 units, 50 units, a hundred? Like, where do you really see this business growing since you've grown so fast over the last three years? You know, where do you really see it going? Okay. So um, at twenty some doors, gross rents are north of thirty thousand a month. PITI is about eighteen thousand, roughly. So that's roughly well, okay. okay. But you have expenses, right? You have water. You have certain things you have to pay. So, um, roughly maybe roughly ten k a month. 
Um, but in three that's years. awesome. In, in three years, yeah, yeah. And let me say how I started, right? I started with my – um, I leveraged some money from my 401K, and I opened up a HELOC, a home equity line of credit. That has been, like, my godsend. Like, that has – gave me the ability to leverage those funds to continue to be aggressive to continue to buy and that HELOC which started at 50k in 2019 I think I opened it up now I've raised it I've increased it because my prop my value of my property has increased I paid the mortgage down I have 250k access to 250k like like a revolving door check and if you're using the Burr method you're just robbing Peter to pay Paul right so to have access to that amount of co capital to continue to grow, it's like game changing. Um, it's insane. I just increased that HELOC like uh, two months ago. Um, I had a my um, amateur bodybuilding competition in February, and before I left to Atlantic City, my wife and I we went to close on that HELOC, and I increased it from I think it was one fifty at that time, and I increased it from one fifty to two fifty. And I just felt like I robbed a bank. I swear to God, <laughs> I said, "Damn, this is." This is crazy. I went there, signed some docs, and within a week, I got a checkbook, and I have access to two hundred fifty thousand. It's crazy. It's crazy. Well, let's talk so, about the process a little bit. Like, how do you get a okay. HELOC in place? Like, what yes. steps are required? You know, walk us through it and like really mm -hmm. simplify that process for us. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I'm going to answer Pat's question and come back to. You. So yeah, my uh, with that, Pat, my goal is not money, right? I'm fortunate. I'm married. I have five kids. I have a family. My um, goal is freedom, right? I want. I have a great six-figure job. I enjoy it, but my goal is freedom. My goal is to be able to um, wake up when I want, go on trips when I want, ensure I have enough uh, funds to, to to raise my family, provide my kids, college, and all that. But that's my goal. My goal is to just have freedom, so I can live life on my own terms. Like driving nice cars and big house, all that stuff's cool. And but I definitely just want the freedom, and flexibility to do what I want to do when I want. You know to do what it. that number is for you? Um, I said it was twenty k, but um, I I think a little more. <laughs> twenty, I say twenty k. Twenty k, I know respectfully, I can live very well, um, and not have to worry about um returning to work. And if I want to work part time as like a remote electrical engineer remotely. Um, then I can, you know, get a, you know, a hundred K job remotely, you know, <laughs> and if I'm netting 20 K, I think my wife and I, and my kids, I think we're respectfully in a good place because that 20 K will, will fluctuate with respect to property taxes, um, um, insurance, but it will go up the other way with respect to rents going up. Right. So I say 20K is a great number for me to phase myself out of my W2. Myself and my wife, she always gets jealous when I say, yeah, I'm going to retire when I'm 40, God's willing. And she say, hey, what about me, asshole? And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> I don't. All right, I got you. <laughs> what What does your yeah. wife do? My wife works at, uh, she's, uh, I, she, uh, I are inter, inter, uh, I can never say it. Inter, inter, she's similar to an x-ray tech, but. Inter intervention radiologist. That's what she works at. Yep, yep, yep. Is yeah. she on board with the whole real estate thing, or was yeah. she initially and now she no, is? No, she she was just not sure, right? Especially because it, we were using leveraging the HELOC, so she was a little apprehensive in the beginning. But no, now she's extremely on board. She's she's supportive. Um, a lot, a few of my tenants are Hispanic speaking. My wife is Puerto Rican, so. She helps me with the translations and sending these texts out and all, and all of that. But yeah, she helps. She's definitely on board. Um, initially, it's tough. It's tough because once you you come and you have to sit down with your other half and say, "Hey, I'm going to take money out of the house." And she looked at me like I had two heads, and she's like, "Well, what if you don't pay it back? They're going to take the house." I said, "Yeah, respectfully, they will, but <laughs> that's not going to happen." So now. She she understands. She she enjoys it. She's there with me at some of these rehabs with my kids, and uh, she helps me with the tenant communication. So definitely, definitely, it's definitely important to have your spouse, or your other half, on board with the process because it's gonna make it's gonna make everything easier. Um, in, in your journey, of course. 
Do you have any advice for some of our listeners out there that are about to get started and they have a spouse that might be kind of on the fence? Like what, what kind of tips or advice do you have for mm-hmm. you know, maybe getting a spouse on board? What, what kind of things did you do? Um, a smooth transition. Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, that's definitely tough. Right. However, it's not impossible. I say just try to probably reassure them with the numbers. Right. And if they can see that the numbers make sense, they're going to be a little more um, um, understanding or considerate with respect to, especially if you're going to leverage funds from your primary residence and you have family, have kids, like that, you know, you need somewhere to sleep at night. Right. So that, oh, so my light went out. Give me one second. Let me, my lights on a timer. You're good. There we go. Uh, um, four lights. Okay. All right. There it is. Yeah. So, yeah, sorry, guys. Yeah, so you're good, man. This is really right. Yeah, this is, <laughs> so definitely, I say definitely um, communicate with your your spouse, show them the numbers, and you know if you gotta bribe them a little bit with a little dinner or a little gift, you know once you close and you start getting that cash flow, you know buy buy your wife a purse, take her to Ruth's Chris, get her a good steak, you know, um, take her on you know on a good weekend or something, whatever to sweeten the pot. Because it's definitely worth it, man. I tell people all the time, man. It's investing in yourself is is so worth it. I mean, I've got 20, 22 doors in le- in about three years. My portfolio is over three million bucks, and to see over ten k a month, I don't see ten k a month because I never, I, I keep, I continue to reinvest. So as a, if I money comes in, money goes right back out. And if you're Same. using hard money. You have to pay interest only payments. Um, you have to pay taxes because you know you have a you don't have a PITI schedule on that said property yet. So money comes in and money goes right back out to continue to build and continue to grow. But definitely yeah. communicate with your spouse, show them the numbers. And I think if you communicate well, show them the numbers, give them a little incentive, I think hopefully they will be able to um um, give you the ability to definitely do what you need to do so you can get started. Because once you get started, you're going to wish you started a while ago. Yeah. And I, uh, so actually little tip that I did is I, I made all the rent payments go to my wife. Mm. So, <laughs> That's a good one. so I started, I had every, I had all the tenants pay her directly through like mm-hmm. Venmo or with the oh, rent yeah. ready app or whatever. I'm like, Hey, you t- my job is to go and find the properties and place the tenants and make sure everything's working. You handle the money. And then mm-hmm. all of a sudden, you know, you get that one property, rent checks are starting coming mm-hmm. in and then you get yeah. two and then you get five and then you get 10. And then all of a sudden you're at it's 30 awesome. it's and it's best. like, Hey, this is working. So when this you go works. to, when you go to go talk about buying that other property, it's like, hell yeah. Mm-hmm. Let me know. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, cause it starts it's not- to be a reality. It's nothing like when people owe you, right? Every month we have car payment, you got mortgage, you got, you know, electric bill, you have insurance, but every month when people have to pay you or your business, it's, it hits different. You feel like, okay, all right, this, this is worth it. This, this, this makes sense for sure. Mm, That's awesome. Mm -hmm. So Dwayne, you got five kids, man. Tell us a little bit about how legacy plays into this, like how your real estate goals kind of play into your future thoughts with your family and your kids. Yes, great question. So my LLC is called Great Legacy LLC because this is why we do this, right? You want to definitely help and give your kids a head start. However, you want to show them, um, give them tips and give them advice and, and give them the, you don't want to just give them everything as well. You want to make them learn and understand, hey, this is a hey, daddy works every day. And when I get out of work, I go see what's going on in said property. I go look at properties. I'm on my phone looking at said properties. But legacy is, is, is huge, right? My son, I have an old, my oldest is 16. My youngest is three. Right. And we're, I bring them to the house when we're doing a little demo or when we're, um, in between um, paint or whatever the case is, but definitely just having kids and having um, that support system, I definitely wanted to give them um, a, a leg up, right? And give them a head start and give them the ability to to bring this further, right? Um, in a few years, when I, when, whenever the good Lord call, call, calls me home, if I have a hundred doors, I hope they can have a thousand doors, you know, once they take uh, over and they can, um take this to the next level right 
So definitely, I definitely do this for my kids and my family and, and my mother and my sibling. You know, it's all about family legacy and putting us, um, us doing the groundwork to put them in a better position later, for sure. So that's my, that was my, the name of my, that's the name of my LLC, Great Legacy LLC. And that's, that's why um, is basically for them, for sure. Your 16 year olds just about old enough to get on payroll now, man. You got to put them, put them to work, get them that little thing. Yes. In. They can contribute it's funny. to the Roth IRA. Yep. It's funny you said that because right now I'm about 70% down to rehab. And I told him to start. I, he helps me. And we. And I, I was an electrician before I was an engineer. So I do all my electric work. I, I wire the houses with plugs and switches and all that. So for this rehab, we made a deal to give him two or three percent of the said profits. I forgot. I forgot the number. So while he's helping me during the rehab, switches, plugs, demo, um, bringing in sheetrock, you know, picking up flooring from Home Depot, and doing all those things. So um, he's he's decided to go to school for electrical engineering, just like myself. And I'm on his. I'm on him. You know, sometimes he looks at me like, "Okay, Dad, I got it." I said, "No, no, you're gonna hear it from me." <laughs> So definitely he's on it and I'm, I'm happy that I'm, he's interested in, in the business, right? Cause th that's why we do this, right? I, I, I don't, I can't do it all or I don't want to do it all forever. Right. So to have my kids involved, have them at the rehabs and seeing the houses take shape, seeing the buildings go from ugly and scary. to wow, daddy, this is yours too. You know, no, this is not my house. This is our house. This is ours. Right. One time we were at a house and, um, I was talking to one of my handyman and my daughter. She was like three or four at a time. And I was just kidding with her. I said, if anyone comes through this door, tell them, get out of my house. And she looked at me. She said, this is my house, daddy. I said, yeah, you didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> so she, yeah, it's funny. It's funny. But yeah, kids, my kids play a major part of my life. And they definitely keep me uh, grounded for sure. That's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And I, I love the name of the LLC. I love the purpose behind it. I love the why that you have. I love everything that you're doing about this. And I, th I think this is a great time to, you know, bring up some of the obstacles you see yourself facing, you know, building this legacy with the current environments going on, you know, trying to add and continue to grow. Like what obstacles do you see yourself facing and overcoming over these next few years? Um, I say one of them probably are interest rates, right? Especially with the six unit that I just agreed on. Um, the cash flow is going to change drastically with the um, leveraging that much debt, right? So let's say the six unit is worth, uh, I don't know, seven, let's say seven, 700 K, right? And if I leverage 70% of that, that's 490, right? Leveraging 500 K, you know, at 8% is well over three, uh, maybe four, maybe $3,000 a month PI, right? You still got tax and insurance, right? So I say that is probably one of the more concerning obstacles I have. And with this particular asset class, I don't really have much, as much control as I, I would like because everything is gonna be predicated on the NOI. I can rate, I can um, under, I can ensure rents will be what the rents will be, but it's gonna determine on the appraiser, the taxes and um, the interest rate, which I don't like that, <laughs> right? For, for ultimate cash flow. But I say, um, even even rehab material material is very expensive, man. Right now, flooring LV, LV, LVP is at least two dollars a square feet. Sometimes north of two fifty three dollars. Um, wood to remember uh framing wood two by fours material was like eight bucks. You know, last summer I think it's gone down a little to four, maybe five an hour, something like that. But interest rates and material prices are are tough when we're doing these value add plays to, to increase equity in these homes. So I, I would say interest rates are number one and the material are number two. It's tough, but it's not impossible. Exactly. It's not impossible at all. It's not impossible at all. And some people, I see a lot of people purchasing properties now and it hopes rates will go down and it'll cash flow later. It's okay. I don't like that for specifically. I want cash. I got a cash flow now. Right. And it, whatever that metric is, 200, 300, 400 door, whatever the case is, that's just going to increase if rates do go down. But I'm not going to buy, I'm me specific, I'm not going to buy anything and have negative cash flow and it hopes um, 
the political environment or whatever or fed or whatever the case changes and i cash flow then like i'm not gonna you know i'm not a betting man i'm, I'm an investor i'm not gambling like that you know exactly and i i think this is the perfect last question before we get to the next segment of the show is for for that first time investor for that person that has one property out there right now What's the one piece of advice, you know, going over everything that we've talked about here on the podcast so far, what's the one piece of advice that you want them to hear from you and listen and take away um, that you think that would help them on, on their journey, get started? Get educated for sure. Get educated and what you're looking to do, right? If you're, if you're truly interested in real estate, you're truly interested in building that business, try to get educated. Um, if you have a commute to work, don't listen to the radio, listen to an audible book, um, listen to a podcast, um, um, listen to a webinar, right? Get educated on what you're looking to do. Start researching markets. If you are fortunate enough to invest in your own backyard, that's awesome. But if you're not, there's other markets um, out of state that you can invest in or even in, in, uh, in your state that you can invest in that you can cash flow. But get educated. Um, there's so many so many books and so many uh, things out there for resources to help you get educated so you can um, remove that level of apprehension and then you can start to say, okay. And once you start that, you're going to start hearing the same terms. You're going to start hearing the same jargon. You're going to start hearing some of the same ideas from these different um, resources. And I think that definitely will help you your thought process, your uh, uh, deal calculation, get you out of analysis paralysis and help you make better um, calculated decisions with respect to investing. So I would say definitely get educated, read some books, right? Just don't, you know, you know, I know Pat is killing it on IG and in his business, but he's, he can, he's going to answer as many questions and, and give you the game, but it's up to you to definitely take action, do it, your dudes, do it yourself. Do some things by yourself or even with your spouse. Get educated and that will you will reap an extreme amount of benefits from that. I love it. 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 And I think th this this is absolutely the perfect transition to the last segment of the show that James and I like to call the big, big four. four. James, take it away. All right, Dwayne, what's something that you do that is a financial independence cheat code or hack that really helps propel your personal finances forward? Um, personal or business finance? What do you, business, you can take it personal or oh, business. I say a home equity line of credit, in my opinion. I mean, I leveraged my HELOC four years ago and I started at 50K and now it's 250K. And that HELOC has made me, uh, bought me a lot of real estate and it's going to continue to buy me a lot of real estate Um, to, to have access to that amount of capital is you know quarter million dollars that's a lot of money uh, entry level for a, a single family house if it's 100k 120k it's like 20 percent you know so 25 30k so you know and if you're using hard money it could be a little less because hard money can only require 10 percent or 15 percent down and then of course you have to renovate the property but once the property is renovated then you're looking at a cash out refinance and you're going to recoup all your funds and satisfy your said heloc that you just tapped the money from so HELOC is a revolving, uh, a revolving amount of capital. You can, you rob yourself, you rob Peter, you pay Paul and you just keep going to grow. So definitely leverage your HELOC, leverage it, leverage it, leverage it. That's equity is, equity means nothing if you don't use it. You can sit on three, 400K worth of equity and you ain't using it, you a dummy. <laughs> you got to use that equity, man. Use that equity to leverage and buy assets for sure. Right. Return on equity. Assets. Can't, you can't, can't uh, beat that for sure. Exactly. We talk about return on equity on this show all the yeah. time. And you hear it once again from another investor. So number two, we call this one resources. So you know you've talked about books. I know you talked about podcasts. I know you talked about people. So could you give our listeners out there um, some recommendations on any books, podcasts, or people that they might not know of or heard of that you think would benefit them? Okay, books. I know a lot of people say rich dad, poor dad, but I would say another great book, which is about financial um, freedom. Um, it's about um, financial literacy is The Compound Effect by Darren Harding. Awesome book. Awesome books that helps you understand just making 
um, continuously effort of making changes to help you get the results you want to get. Um, another book is The Millionaire Next Door. That's a great mindset shift that make you understand um, about once you become a little affluent with money and capital, how you can make better decisions. Podcasts. I'm big on podcasts. I listen to your pod, this podcast, um, Bigger Pockets, um, Rookie Podcasts. Um, oh, another podcast, the guy is called Mike something. It's called One Rental at a Time. Another uh, podcast. Zuber. Mike Zuber. Yeah, Mike Zuber. Mike Zuber. I, I listen to podcasts all the time. I don't listen to much music when I'm driving. I just try to feed my brain better stuff than, you know, than that. I listen to music when I'm in the gym, right? Now, webinars, right? I watch webinars. Um, I used to do more when I was in the beginning of investing, but now I'm starting to get the hang of it. And now I'm busy with my own rehabs. You know, last summer I had like six rehabs going on at one time, right? But using these resources definitely help you um, stay engaged and, and help you um, get over the hump and, and, and keep you keep your head in the game to continue to invest. So definitely podcasts, webinars, Audible, get Audible. Um, if you don't have time to read books, get Audible. I, use, I have about a, a 45 to an hour uh, commute. And that's two hours a day that you can listen to a book. An average audible book is maybe six hours, maybe eight hours, right? And you yep. you can knock out a book in a couple of days, right? And that is going to help you tremendously to feed your brain to understand about investing, financial literacy, numbers, or whatever the case is. Yep. Exactly. Great, great, great ones. James, number three. Of course. Hey, Dwayne, so it's five years in the future, my friend. Where's your personal life at? Where's your business life at? You know, what does it look like? Wow. Right now? Oh, that's a good, good question. Five years in the future, I hope to be retired from my nine to five. I hope to be probably moved out of the state of New Jersey to either Texas or Florida, somewhere a little warmer. Um, uh, and my business hopefully will be at at least 50 doors. Um and I can continue 50 doors and continue to invest strongly because as long as I got air in my lungs, I'm going to be buying properties. That's it. I'm not going to stop. <laughs> Don't forget about retiring your wife, man. Can't leave her. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She'll be all right. No, no. She'll, <laughs> she'll, be, <laughs> she'll, be, she'll, be, she'll be there. She'll be there with me for sure. 100%. Perfect. <laughs> well, That's amazing. I have no other way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's amazing. All right. The last one for all the listeners out there that want to follow along on this journey, where's the best place for them to reach out? If they want to reach out and tell you that they were inspired by this episode, have any questions for you and just follow along in your journey, let them know where's the best place to reach out and to follow you. Awesome. Yep. So my uh, Instagram, Instagram is primarily where I'm on uh, my handle name. I don't, is handle what they call it. Yeah. Handle hat, whatever. It's called One Rental at a Time NJ. It's one um, underscore um, rental underscore at a time, under, uh, so on. So one rental at a time NJ. It's just me and Mark. Mark, Mike, Zuber, what's his name? Zuber. Zuber, Mr. Zuber. I, I think we're the only ones with that name. So mine is New Jersey because that's where I primarily invest. So definitely if anybody has any questions or want to uh, follow my journey, please give me a follow um, and feel free to DM me if you have any questions. I'll try to answer you as quickly as I can, but as an investor, as a full-time worker, father of five, I'm a little busy, but I wouldn't take it no other way. I love, I love being busy and, and, and just um, doing all the things I have to do for sure. Well, give them a follow. I follow them. That's how we ended up here having this conversation today, yep. you know, following each other on Instagram. He reached out. I've reached out, you know, that's how things happen. It's all about networking. So you guys know the drill. This podcast is free. This information is free, but we do ask for one small payment and that's in the form of you liking, commenting, and sharing this podcast with someone that you know, someone that you think would benefit from this. And also if you haven't already, a lot of you have, we're almost at 70 reviews. Leave us a review, Apple, Spotify, Google, all of that good stuff. Send us a DM and we'll catch you next time. See you guys. See you guys. Thanks.